Hello everyone and welcome back to Talking Wild. I am your host Stefano Daza and I'm so excited to have you here for episode 6 of our Zeba podcast. Before we get started, I want to thank everyone who has been tuning in for our weekly discussions. If you want to support our podcast and all other Zeba projects, head over to our website at zebaapparel.com to shop your favorite Zeba merch. I'm also very excited to announce that our latest collection, Ecosystems, is now available. Ecosystems is our fourth apparel line, inspired by the beauty, the power, and the fragility of our changing planet. The project was a collaboration between Zeba and three incredible artists, and it features many firsts for our company, including the first 100% sustainable fabric products. All right, on today's episode, I'm joined by my very good friend, Suyash Keshri. Suyash is a 24-year-old wildlife filmmaker and presenter based in New Delhi, India. He recently produced his very first series, Safari with Suyash, for WWF International, a web series focusing on tigers and tiger, and tiger conservation in Bangavard National Park. Suyash was also the main cameraman and co-director for Zeba's documentary, Africa Rewilded. I love this guy because our worldviews are very much aligned. Similarly to me, Suyash's goal is to tell stories that would evoke passion in the hearts and minds across the world and urge them to play their part in conserving our beautiful, natural heritage. In this episode of the podcast, we pick up where we left off on episode one of Talking Wild. We talk about the amazing experiences of filming Africa Rewilded and the skills and techniques required to successfully film animals in the wild. If you're an aspiring filmmaker or just curious about how we filmed our documentary, then this episode is perfect for you. So without further ado, I bring you episode six of Talking Wild. All right, so today on the podcast, I'm rejoined by my very good friend, the one and only Suyash Kesri. Suyash, welcome to the podcast, man. Thanks, dude. So good to see you. You were actually on episode one of Talking Wild. You were the guy who inspired me to start a podcast. So <laughs> it's awesome to have you back on, dude. Thanks, um, man. I'm glad, I, I'm glad I could come back and we have a lot to talk about and pick up from. Yeah, we did. So last time we were talking about um, when we got to South Africa and we started filming, we were getting chased by some lions. Absolutely. Uh, so let's kind of go back a little bit and explain to people like why we were getting chased by those lions <laughs> or even even more so the first night that we got chased by some lions. Do you yeah. want to read that story? I would love to. Um, and of course, for people who don't know me, uh, I'm a wildlife filmmaker and presenter and I'm based out of uh, New Delhi, India. And Stefano and I met uh, a couple of years ago in South Africa while I was filming there. But uh, so we're going to get to your wildlife filmmaking profession in a little absolutely. bit. Cool. So if you stay tuned for that. Yeah. And OK, so coming to the story, it was it's one of the most bizarre things that happened in my life. I have worked with big cats all my life, but I've never been chased by one. Thank God. I, you know, work with tigers all across India. I've, I've worked with lions in Africa. Uh, leopards, cheetahs, and nothing that bizarre has ever happened. So as, as I, could, I could paint a picture for everyone, you know, just close your eyes. We are in the middle of Africa. This was our first night. Uh, it, it's deep in South African bush. So think, think not savanna, but just bushy conditions where... Thorny where, bushes around you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thorny bushes around you. But the thing is, not like you can see them properly because it's middle of the night. We've had our dinner and we were going to go back to our, our, our rooms and just go, go and sleep. But I was like, you know what? Uh, we have the vehicle to ourselves. Why don't we go on for a drive? Just explore the reserve at nighttime. So we took the, took the vehicle, uh, switched on the lights. And of course, in the, on our way, we saw some wildebeest, saw some impala. The night was really, really cold. It was uh, nice and starry, and then we we came to this part of the reserve where where the lions are supposed to be. That's where the territory is. So as soon as we passed through that area, 
and we, we noticed three lions that were two, two males and one female. And suddenly it dawned on me that they were way too close to us. Somehow when it's dark out, you're way, way too close. And somehow when it's dark out, you just don't see how close animals are. And especially because like I am behind the wheel. And Stefano, I think, was trying to record a story or something or like talk to me. Of the Toyota truck. Yeah. Well, not Toyota. It was a Land Rover. Land yeah. Rover. Land Rover truck. And I was behind the wheel and I was just navigating everything. And all I could see is what's in front of me, not what's left and right. So it wasn't until the lines came very close to us that we saw them. Right next to me in the passenger window, I made direct eye contact with yeah, the lion. Yeah, hundred percent. Like scariest things in my life. <laughs> seriously, dude. Seriously, like I, I joke with people that sometimes I've got so close to tigers that I could pluck out a whisker, um, <laughs> and <laughs> not like I would ever do that. But that's the position you were in. Like if if Stefano if Stefano reached his hand out, guys, like the lions, he could have touched the lions. We could definitely smell them. Yeah. So I, I stopped immediately. I was like, am I doing something wrong? Like, did something happen? Like, why are they so close to the vehicle? Why are they so interested in the vehicle? Because big cats are never like that. You know, they never attack the vehicle, especially in a reserve, which so many tourists go to. They're used to it. They just see this this vehicle. Yeah, this, they're accustomed to it. They see this vehicle as being a part of the environment that you don't really uh, need to be scared of or not even need to hunt. So then chasing or, or then coming so close and being so investigative and curious was was absolutely baffling. So I stopped and I was like, oh, my God. And, of course, uh, both Stefano and I said a slurry of words that are, too, that are too foul to repeat. But then I looked at the lions and I was like, okay, you know what? Maybe they're uncomfortable with us being around. Uh, let me drive forward a little bit. Maybe I hadn't seen them and maybe I startled them. So I started driving forward and then Stefano was like, whoa, 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 whoa. I was like, what, whoa, 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 what? And the lions were chasing us. <laughs> car. They were literally chasing the car. And at that moment, I stopped again because I was like, you know, that's what my training is. When, a, when an animal is chasing you, you don't let the animal chase you. You just stop when you're in a vehicle. Well, that's just, I'm saying that lightly. Uh, it all depends on the situation. If, it, if it's animal. a, exactly. other animals, like rhinos, you just keep driving. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, with certain animals, you stop. You don't stop with buffalo. Um, but then again, you have to really observe the posture, the really observe the behavior. But in this instance, you have to stop because you just don't really understand. And the lions, when they were chasing us, they weren't being aggressive. There was no snarling. There was no, there was no, uh, you know, showing of teeth. So it was so confusing. So I stopped again, and then the lion stopped, and it was really close to Stefano again. And then I saw the lioness, her her hazel eyes just glistening in, in the light, and it it felt like she was not looking at me, but literally looking through me. And the hairs on the back of my back stood up. So I was like, you know what? This doesn't look good. I'm just going to drive. I just had a really eerie feeling. So we just kept driving, driving, and driving. And the lions kept following, following, and following. It was crazy. Um, it was so scary. It was so scary. Why was happening? Yeah. What's so, until the next day when yeah. we talked but to There was another. Yeah. But <clears throat> even the next day, we did not exactly find out until the evening. In the morning, we went about our business, and same thing happened with elephants, with uh, buffalo, uh, and, and the rhinos, and it was just so scary for me because it was not my vehicle. I wasn't scared that, that we would get harmed. I was more scared of the fact that I will have to explain all the dents in the vehicle if they come too close. Okay, let's, let's explain what happened with the elephants when we had millennium come to us and bump us gently and <laughs> we you were reading the situation really well you were talking to him keeping him calm and he like slightly bumped the vehicle once yeah you were like yeah hey hey, hey. And, then <laughs> yeah. He did. And, and like a little bump felt like a huge rocket to Absolutely. us and he Absolutely. left the in the car and then we drove away yeah but we were like why is this happening to us we were the right. only being chased on by 
every animal in the reserve, and we were so confused. 100%. And, you know, it happened with that, uh, with Nana. So Nana is the matriarch of the herd uh, in, in this specific reserve. And Nana did that. Uh, uh, Millennium did that. There's also a video, actually, you can check out on Zeba, Zeba's ch uh, YouTube channel that, I'm, I'm, you know, this both the elephants, like, in both times. So the, the video is only of Nana, but they come close to us. They are very investigative. Immediately, I cannot see any any signs of malice or or aggression. There's no you know ears going uh, going going uh, up. There's no tail going up. There's no curling of the tusk into in towards the mouth and away from or not the tusk the trunk away from the tusks. And there's no posturing. There's no, nothing like that. So I'm just talking to her very calmly. I was like. It's okay. Uh, we're not here to hurt you. Like, a, a, please don't get close to the vehicle. Watch the rear view mirror and all that kind of stuff. And there's this guy in the back of the uh, back of the truck who's never seen, uh, you know, been in the situation before, and he flipping out. Yeah, he's flipping out. He's like, "See, you drive. You're gonna get us killed and all this kind of stuff." And I'm like, "Just let me deal with it. I've been in these situations." Yeah. So I really wanted to know what's going on. You see, when humans want to investigate something, they touch, they touch it, they smell it. So that's what elephants would do. That's what any animal would do. First, they would sm smell it, of course, see it, and then smell it. But then they proceed to touch it. So Nana and Millennium both did it with with their with their uh, trunks first, and then one of them they put their tusk uh, close to it, close to the vehicle. And when a six-ton elephant touches your vehicle, while your vehicle freaking rocks back and forth. For him, it was just a touch. It was just, literally just, it was so much as that. But our vehicle rocked and I was like, oh my God. And I was like, yeah, it was a <laughs> Thankfully, we recorded that and like we showed it to the owner so they weren't as pissed at us because thankfully we did that. But that happened and I was like, hey, 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 stop, stop. And then Nana stopped and she went her own way. But the second time, Millennium, he did not stop. He, it's not that he came back with more force. He just kept nudging it slowly, very slowly. That's when I decided to drive off. But he, then, then he started chasing the vehicle, which was not good. Ideally, if I was in another vehicle, I would have stopped and he would have stopped chasing. But in this vehicle, there was something really ominous. Yeah. So finally, we talked to the owners um, and, you know, said that this is happening, like all animals are chasing us. Yeah. Every animal, yeah. literally, literally, even even the, um, the, the uh, I'm forgetting the names of the little turkey-like birds. Uh, oh, guinea fowl. Yeah, the, even the guinea fowl, <laughs> even the guinea fowl were chasing us. And Which, like Remember, we're trying to film a documentary of wildlife in their natural habitat. So even though it's kind of cool that they, you can get these close shots from the animals like coming to your car, it's still not ideal because yeah. you're not able to film them being natural. They're literally always coming at you and it's always us driving away. So right. we were actually being phased negatively by this. Absolutely. It's, it's completely unnatural. And I explained my predicament to the owners. I told them, look, I've, I've been in the bush for so long. I've worked with wildlife all my, nearly my entire life. I've never had this experience. Then they said, well, you know, the, the vehicle you're in, we use it to feed the animals in times of drought, um, including the lions. Now, that's where it struck me, those, those animals. And this is where I want to say it's not this. The story is not about agreeing to agreeing or disagreeing about their methods, about feeding wild animals uh, from this vehicle. But I'm just telling you the facts. So they told us that. Then I realized that the animals are seeing the specific vehicle and the they specific know. sound of the vehicle, and they know it. They they see it that they are gonna get food. That's why they're not being aggressive. They just running after it like a puppy would when you have a treat in hand. And it was bizarre. We were also filming during a time of drought. So these animals are especially hungry. They hear their car, that they're so accustomed to, you know, hearing when, they, when they're being fed. 
Yeah. They're hungry and they're gonna chase it. And we were the ones driving it. <laughs> Their reserve is so incredibly small compared yeah. to, you know, other reserves that natural processes can't fully occur because of the lack of size. So there Absolutely. needs to be more direct human intervention, even with the carnivores, because they don't give their carnivores full range of the entire reserve. They manage yeah. them in sections so that they can control right. their populations. And, you know, during times of drought, if there is not a lot of, let's say, like prey, like warthogs, uh, antelope, then you need to be able to supplement those because lions require so much food, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, a pride, especially. And so yeah, you, you know. Can't your, you can't let your million dollar lions die out <laughs> because there is a drought going on. You, you'll you try to it as natural as you can and as absolutely. It, you'll try to keep yeah. those. And I, and I do want to mention to, uh, you know, listeners who might be thinking, well, this is not needed in the natural world. I think, you know, I, I'm of the belief that this would never be needed if, if us humans were not plundering the natural world so much. I mean, nowadays in, in a country like South Africa, it's not as wild as you might think. All these animals are re- re- living in protected, fenced habitats. Uh, Kruger National Park is one of the only places in the world which is which has free-ranging animals. But even then, wildlife management has to be so hands-on precisely because of all the unsustainable actions of humans. So it's just like different way of thinking. It's Wildlife is not completely wild anymore, unfortunately. And the only way we can continue saving species is by being severely involved. It's, it's, um, it's not the best, it's not the ideal option, but it, it, it is what must be done. Right. The lack of area that these animals have for free review has made it a requirement for humans to, you know, interfere and try to keep natural processes, imitate natural processes as much as they can. Um, and to their, you know, to their credit, they do a really good job of just doing it when it's absolutely necessary. When it's like life. Yeah. I mean, if they didn't do it, then they won't have, well, the world would have one less herd of elephant, one less herd of buffalo, one less pride of lions. And we don't want that. (laughs) And these animals are not like tamed. Like these animals, like you can jump out of the car and pet them. These are fully wild lions that like, they will eat you if they see you out of a car. They will, you know, like... They won't eat you like that because no lion does that. It's it's, it's, it's a false uh, belief that lions or any wild animals are uh, malicious. So they're, they're probably, you know, most big cats, in my experience, if you, like, if you were to be stupid enough to jump out of the vehicle, they'll get startled and run away um, because they are all... All wild animals are... Uh, accustomed to fearing humans or they're wired to fear humans but right. yes in the unlikely event that that doesn't happen this use a threat well you're going well, to be in big trouble it also depends on how you act around them right like yeah when, when we had that kid in the back of the car flipping out and not being calm while we were filming elephants or rhinos you could see the animals react in a certain way than when you yeah. talk calmly and know how to act Absolutely. so so you have to know what you're doing when you're filming wildlife. And, you know, thank God we had you and our team. When we were <laughs> filming. And also, once we knew what was up with the car, then we could work around it and like yeah. film distance. And then when animals start getting too close, we knew why and we were able to drive off. And that really Absolutely. changed uh, the yeah. dynamic of filming. But 100%. yeah, you really need to know what you're doing around wildlife because if you don't then it's dangerous for you it's dangerous for the animal and you can't you know get the shots that you want yeah absolutely absolutely so i was thinking about talking a little bit about what our daily routine was when we were filming in south africa um you know we were there for a very short amount of time to film a documentary like usually documentaries take months of filming and editing we were there for quite literally three weeks and then we 
we weren't even in the reserve for three weeks because we had to go to the coast and film, you know, at Muscle Bay. So my goal was always to maximize the amount of filming that we could do each day. But from you, I learned that you can't just go out and get the shots that you want. You have to get the shots that you are lucky enough to to see that day. And then you have to be lucky enough to actually be in the right spot and have everything set up so that when the shot happens for that one second, you're yeah. there in entirety. Yeah. So do you want to talk a little bit about that and like how you how you know what to anticipate and how to plan for it and all that thing. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, mostly I, I, I was tasked with deciding the schedule for the days and stuff. And I would, you know, ask them to wake up at an ungodly hour of 5.30 a.m. <laughs> because Everybody. we wanted to catch, yeah, because we wanted to catch the first light of the sun hitting animals' faces. Um, that's where the best filming light is. That's where the best time is to observe behavior, especially with uh, big cats. You know, they're they're not nocturnal as such, but they're crepuscular. Crepuscular being they're active more uh, between dawn and dusk, or rather during dawn and dusk. Uh, so we want to do that. So yeah, we would start uh, early, 5:30, have a, a strong cup of coffee, head out, film, film until about eight or nine and come back for breakfast, then go out after breakfast, film until say one o'clock, have lunch, and then go out again, and then only return around uh, seven o'clock after sunset, uh, and take shower and go straight to dinner, and then we would repeat the same thing over and over again. Uh, in terms of like, you know, answering your second question in uh, how to film animals, or how do I predict the behavior and stuff for every animal it's different what i usually try is as a filmmaker what i want to do is especially if i'm also driving or if i'm working with someone who knows that stuff what they would do is we would we would position we would see an animal and then position a quite some distance away say at least like if we see a a elephant we would position at least 40 50 meters away not permanently just for a couple minutes we would stay there, observe the herd dynamic. Are they stressed? Are they just feeding? Uh, is there some internal turmoil? Uh, are they aware uh, a little too much of the of what's going on around them? Uh, do they is feel it, threatened? Is it like exactly? Conditions really affect the situation. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. So we would see that with every single animal, and then move in closer uh, for filming. With all animals, it's. it's there's always a invisible line that you must not cross. So sometimes what we do is we position like 20 meters away. And then once the animal gets comfortable, they themselves uh, approach us just to sniff us or, or, you know, make sure that we're not a threat, especially with elephants. Or what they do is they get so comfortable that you can just see their natural behavior. And since we have these long lenses, we never need to push that boundary to get closer. And then, so you just mentioned lenses. I want to talk a little bit about the equipment that we had yeah. and how we were able to, you know, utilize drones, uh -huh. how we were able to utilize time lapses, how we were yeah. able to use these really good Sony uh, and another equipment that you had to get really close um, and get the action from quite a bit away. You know, yeah. you don't have to face to face with these animals in order to 100%. really get close up and personal with them um but it does require some time to even set up the cameras and everything yeah. so i remember you would have to you would be like okay this herd will be moving to the left and this so i'm going to set up my camera right here and <laughs> it would happen and pre visualization yeah you know, some pretty amazing shots 100 percent. i mean pre visualization is so it's key that's why you need to understand animal behavior. The, you know, I I know over the years that. Keep going. Can you repeat that? Sorry. Yeah. yeah so pre-visualization is so so important. That's why you need to understand animal behavior and visualize your shot according to that. Um, so yes, we had amazing 4K equipment. We were able to use drones, which which drones that zoom in. So that it doesn't uh, disturb animals, and 
these 4K equipment along with these big lenses, like 600 millimeter lenses, uh, 500 millimeter lenses, you don't have to be close to animals, you're so far away and they're doing their own thing. The, the most important thing, as I said about behavior and pre-visualization is that you must position yourself accordingly to match that frame and match that position of the animal with yours. Because what you want is you want the viewer to be seeing wildlife from their own perspective, sitting on their couch, but being transported into an African safari experience kind of thing. So you want to get to their eye level or you want to get to a perspective which is, which is you know, camouflaging them with different greeneries or yellows. And you really have to find a way to make it more appealing to the viewer. And that's what the key was. It's an art. And then to make that art even more difficult, and this was so apparent in our team because, you know, you had a team of three you, me, and this other kid. And this other kid came from a cinematography background, if you can even call it that. <laughs> where you would you tell actors, this is what you need to do, and you set up the environment, and you control yeah. the light. None of that. Like, it was just a completely yeah. different type of filmmaking. Absolutely. And it was very difficult for him to understand that. Yeah. Um, like... When you're shooting wildlife, you are shooting on their terms. Yeah. They, you can't tell them what to do. They, you go, you go out there and you get what you can. And if you can't get the shot that you can that you wanted, then you just have to come back another day and hope to get it. Yeah. And that was something that was new for me to learn because I had never done any wildlife filmmaking. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you know, I learned something very important. Uh, about myself interacting with uh, a third guy and that is that when i'm filming i need to be very very comfortable and trusting of my fellow companions the reason is stefano if i told you that day when when the when the lions were chasing us or if if uh, not told you, but if you had reacted in a different manner when the lions were chasing our vehicle or when Nana bumped our vehicle, with, which already the guy in the back was reacting in a different manner, and animals pick up these pheromones, they pick up these feelings. So, hormones, yeah. Yeah, stress hormones, they get released like that. And if, if one of you were to shout or release those kind of things, which already one was doing, then it would have completely been a disaster for us. So what I learned about myself is I need to be very comfortable around people I work with and trust them. Otherwise, I will not be able to function because my stress level during those times, I was more stressed about the guy at the back of the vehicle than what the elephant would do to us because he, he was just going at me and I was just like, you know what? Because you're screaming, shouting at me, I might make a mistake in observing the animal's behavior because it's so much so as you know the the ear moving from 60 degrees to 90 degrees to this other way Dude, that, that, that there. yeah <laughs> like such that a, if you if you don't see that then you you go you're good well, good is gone not even that, but like i remember there were instances when we were filming rhinos and they're like acting very calmly a bit away you know eating greenery but they were close to the car, but they yeah. were comfortable. They were showing any sign and, and we would be filming these getting amazing shots. And then this kid would be screaming like, yeah. drive away, drive away. Like, and just ruining one of the most incredible opportunities that we had for filming. One of the most rare and difficult to film animals in that reserve. Cause yeah. rhinos are super elusive. They were very hard to track. Um, so it's, you know, you're so right. It's a matter of being safe. It's a matter of getting the shots that you need. If you don't yeah. have people who are fully confident um, in, you know, your abilities or their own abilities around wildlife, it can be not even like, like slow you down. It can literally hurt your progress. And Absolutely. that happened. Yeah. In our yeah. 100%. Great. And you know, it's it's different having guests around. People might think like, oh, then I hate. People might get this the wrong way that I don't like being with people who don't understand wildlife. It's not that having guests around, like 
I take guests from all across the world on tiger safaris. People who've never even seen wild tigers or or done anything around any other wild animal. That's that's a complete different thing because then I'm focusing on main, making sure that my guests are having a good experience and not not making sure that we're getting the best footage. Because the, the, the goal is different. But here the goal was the best footage and best uh, you know uh, experience to be recorded. So it wasn't to make sure that the guy at the back feels safe and secure. <laughs> right. Especially with our complete shortage of time that we had. You know, like yeah, well. if we didn't get all of our shots in those two weeks that we were at the reserve, we just wouldn't have those shots. Awesome. So um, it's really a matter of knowing what you're doing and and then using that short time to the best of your your advantage. A hundred percent. So I want to get a little bit. I don't think I think we'll need to do a, a third episode together to get a little bit into Deal. your your um, filmmaking history. Um, but in conclusion, I just want to get like what your favorite part of being in South Africa with us because you were in South Africa prior yeah. to us. What's your favorite part of filming Africa Rewilded? with the Zeba team, what did you enjoy most? You know, this might sound very cliche, but it, it was actually like spending time with you. Like, and I don't mean that, you know, I don't want viewers to think uh, this in the wrong way. It's like, it's like having a brother uh, who, who for a change is, as, is you know, as, as old as me, is, he comes from a similar family background, uh, is very passionate and, cares about wildlife and thinks about wildlife in quite the same way as I do. But the thing is, because all my experiences, especially in India, there were people who are my dad's age in wildlife industry. There's nobody young. And even my experiences in Africa, there wasn't anybody who was exactly my age, kind of my background, who I could connect with on an instant, um, which of course lends itself to great experiences for sure. But just having someone there who it felt like a very brotherly endeavor and i really enjoyed that yeah i really enjoyed that simple like it was it was it was fun it was crazy it was wild it was heated and it, that's what made it so much fun because it was like you're sharing this experience with uh someone you're really close to now right i completely agree dude <laughs> like this is why we're such good friends because we have very similar outlooks and it was 100%. cool because like Whenever I would say, listen, like, I want this shot, you would be so down for it, you know, like, <laughs> you were just, how can we do that? And whenever you had a suggestion, like, I trusted you, and I would just say, let's do it, you know? And, like, that's how we were able to pull off, you know, not to, like, toot our own horn, but, like, a really good documentary in the short amount of time that we had, because we were just some kids that had a big vision, and we had, we were given the means to do it, and we did it. Yeah. And I think, you know, like one more thing was I we are both open to uh, new perspectives. I think in the wildlife field, in the conservation field, it's much like politics that if you say X, Y, Z, then you are not a conservationist. Or if you say X, Y, Z, then you're a leftist or a rightist. So things like, and I'm not going to explain um i'm I'm not going to delve into our thoughts on this because it's very very uh debatable but things about like uh veganism things about uh just global warming in general things about climate change things about hunting trophy hunting rhino horn dehorning or uh inserting the poison into rhino horns so they're rendered in in uh unusable uh, things like spading different animals to control population measures, all of that stuff. And it's not that I'm saying that Stefano and I were on, on the, uh, you know, one side or the other about it, but we were able to learn about what everyone in this field who are professionals have more experience than us are telling us about it and, and showing why it might be necessary or why it sucks. And you know, both, both sides are important. A lot of that was because... 
we have experience in these fields. So we were able to approach these things with a very open mind, having some information prior. Um, if you're new to the field of conservation or wildlife filmmaking and you're thrown into South Africa, you will get your whole world view just tilted on its head overnight and it will be overwhelming. So because we've, you know, because we've been in South Africa before, because you filmed in India and we've talked to experts and stuff, we kind of know this space and know kind of like the general ideas of these things. So when we heard, um, you know, things that were contrary to what we believed or what we might think, we were able to come at it with an open mind Absolutely. and see, you know, like, maybe, maybe this is right. Like, maybe I don't agree with this full heartedly, but like, maybe it's coming from the right place. Yeah. There's and, some merit in every argument. Exactly. And, and that was really important for us to tell our story, um, which was a very different kind of story. It was about, you know, private landowners, returning back to, to the wild, which is, I feel not a lot of documentaries, you know, focus on restoration of land. They focus on like that pristine land that has never been touched. Yeah. And just because of the matter of the content, it is very, you know, like socio-economic, socio-political. Um, we did a good job at staying away from any sort of like controversial politics or anything. But personally, we needed to know that kind of stuff to tell our story. And because we yeah. were, a similar, similar minded, um, similar minded team, you know, we didn't have those internal conflicts. We knew what we wanted to say. Um, like you said, we wouldn't agree on everything. And like, hopefully nobody ever agrees 100% on everything. It's yeah. good to have, yeah. but, um, yeah, I completely agree that that was like very important. And dude, yeah. for me, same thing. One of the best parts of that whole trip was just being with you and being with <laughs> someone was so excited to be out in nature and loved wildlife like just as much if not more than I do <laughs> and yeah. I love animals. Like, when you're out there just seeing how excited you would get when you would see a certain animal yeah. like that was the most awesome thing because because we, we were with people we were we won't name any names but we were with people when we were filming lions face to face and they would be like yawning saying I'm bored yeah, like, that was just incomprehensible. 100%. To us. That was like almost like disgusting. <laughs> Absolutely, you know. So uh, since you said right, like I get excited with everything uh, in wildlife, and yeah, like if I see a dung beetle rolling up, just like you and I, we would love that. We'd be like that's so cool. This and guy. with respect to dung beetle, I don't expect everyone out there in the world to respect or love the dung beetle as much as I would, or get excited about. But the thing is, you have to get excited about the Lion King and lions in front of you. Come on. If you're a normal human being, you would get excited about lions in front of you. It's this guy was just like yawning and he's like, I'm bored. Let's go. And I'm like, come on, dude. <laughs> I don't know. Complete lack of respect for yeah. the top predator in the savannah is just kind of infuriating. But again, like it's it's again a matter of when you when you travel when you have experiences more important than perhaps these experiences is who you share these experiences with yeah. um and on a professional level you know um your team is like 70 80 percent of how successful you are yeah. and that's something that we really learned during our project absolutely through through a tough learning man all right so Sush, i think that cool. we end it on this note and then save one whole episode <laughs> I, you're an amazing guy and the oh, the thanks. type of experience and stuff that you're doing with uh wildlife filmmaking in india and specifically tigers is like renowned by major organizations like wwf and you know uh animal planet so i really want to have a separate episode where we dive into that but i appreciate you coming into talking wild once again and I love you, bro. You know that you're always going <laughs> to do the next episode with you, dude. Thanks, man. Love you, too. And uh, to all the listeners, thank you for tuning in. It's been a pleasure sharing our stories. Right, make sure you tune in for the next episode with Suyash. And follow Suyash on Instagram if you haven't. What's Suyash? What is your handle? Uh, just Suyash Kestri. So S-U-Y-A-S-H. 
uh, K-E-S-H-A-R-I. You can see my uh, YouTube channel, Instagram, Facebook, website. It's all the same. Yeah, and if you guys haven't seen Suyash's series, Safari with Suyash, please do yourself a favor yeah. and watch it now. It's on YouTube, right? Yeah, it's now it's on YouTube. Uh, you can just type Safari with Suyash or go on to WWF International's YouTube channel, and then you can see that as well. There are five episodes, so make sure you watch all of them. Amazing. You guys won't. <laughs> all right, Thanks, Sush, so have a good night. I know it's late over there in India. You got to yes, go back sir. to sleep. I appreciate you coming on, man. Cheers, man. Have Thank you. Bye. Bye. Join us on future episodes of Talking Wild every Monday as we have more fascinating guests join us to talk about everything nature, wildlife, and conservation. If you enjoyed this episode, please let us know by liking and sharing. And if you'd like to support Zeba, head over to our website at zebaapparel.com to shop your favorite Zeba merch. Thank you for joining us and remember to stay wild.